Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2020 Trilac Annual Conference. It is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Trilac team. My name is Trudy Hartzenberg, and I'm the Executive Director. It is now my great honor to hand over to the Chair of the Trilac Board, Mr. George Lipimili, for the opening remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Trudy. The Honorable Minister for Trade and Industry of Ghana, Mr. Alan Kilematen, distinguished members of the board of the Trade Law Center, TRALAC, the TRALAC Associates, and our alumni networks across Africa. The Right Honorable Judges of the Commerce Court of Justice, His Excellence, Albert Muchanga, Commissioner for Trade and Industry, Africa Union Commission, His Excellency Wankele Mene, Secretary General of the African Coordinator of Free Trade Area, His Excellency Ambassador Alan Wolf, Director General, Deputy Director General, World Trade Organization, Women in Trade Governance Network members, may I simply say distinguished participants. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the TRALAC 2020 Annual Conference under the theme, Trade Governance in Africa, Mid-East Epidemic and the Other Global Challenges. We are deeply honored and humbled by the presence and participation of the Honorable Minister for Trade and Industry, Mr. Alan Krematen, His Excellency Ambassador, Albert Mishanga, and His Excellency Ambassador, Wamkele Mene, in our conference today. And of further importance, allow me to extend our thanks to our development partners, without whom this conference could not be possible. I recognize the GIZ, City of Sweden, and the USAID. We also acknowledge our collaboration with the African Union Commission which predates the launch of the negotiations of the African continent of free trade area. And we were honored to have participated in the inaugural Africa Integration Day, where TRALAC was given the opportunity to share its perspective on the lessons from COVID-19 for Africa's trade facilitation agenda. In recent years, ladies and gentlemen, we have taken TRALAC's flagship event to the region, hosting the annual conference in Zambia, Namibia, and in Rwanda on the day after the extraordinary summit at which the African continent of free trade area was adopted by the members of the African Union, and the agreement was opened for signature and ratification. And the last year, we had another conference in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, we meet at the time of crisis. First, the global COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has impacted us all, and it has brought economic activity to a near standstill in many countries as they impose tight restriction to contain the spread of the virus. According, according to the 2020 report by the World Bank, most countries are expected to face a recession in 2020. This is bad news for us as developing countries. The measures adopted by governments while undoubtedly necessary to, help human, to save human lives have also unfortunately reversed years of progress on the important economic and social goals. The lockdowns and restriction of travel beyond borders has sadly impacted on the speed of market integration on the continent. TRALAC has devoted much resources to collect, curate, and analyze the impact of the pandemic and the specific measures that countries are adopting to curb its spread and its impact on Africa's trade. In today's session, our esteemed panelists will discuss the lessons learned from the COVID-19 and what needs to be done to facilitate trade in Africa. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, there is, it is the crisis in multilateral trade governance. As you may be aware, the apparent body of the WTO has not been functional since December 2019. 
and no new appointments have been made. It is clear that reform, transformation, and new formula are necessary. Our, our attention is now focused on, the, on Geneva as we monitor the process of appointing a new director general. With three African candidates in the running, we have a specific and important interest in this process. In the second session of this conference, His Excellency Ambassador Alan Wolf, who is the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, will take us on a journey of what the future of the World Trade Organization could look like and what reforms are required to enhance the effectiveness of the multilateral trade agreements and organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the crisis, African countries are continuing negotiations on the outstanding issues necessary for trade under the Africa Coordinator of Free Trade Area to begin. COVID-19 has disrupted the process, but not derailed them. The aim is to start trade under the new regime by 1st January 2021. The timeline is tight and much remains to be done. In tomorrow's sessions, we will provide an update on the status of the negotiations in the context of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, institutional arrangements, and the impact on the Africa's global trade relations. We will also explore the desired outcomes from the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and the tools and commitments required to achieve these outcomes. It is our sincere hope that this conference will contribute towards progressing the African continental free trade area agenda. On this note, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome His Excellence, Mr. Albert Muchanga, Commissioner for Trade and Industry, African Union Commission to deliver the keynote address. His Excellence Ambassador Albert Muchanga is a well-known person to all of us. He's currently African Union Commissioner for Trade and Industry. He previously worked in Zambia Civil Service at home and abroad and as Deputy Executive Secretary of SADC. In his current position, he has provided strategic leadership in facilitating negotiations, conclusions, and ratification of the agreement establishing the African Continental Free Trade Area. In addition, His Excellency Albert Mushanga has provided similar leadership on matters of trade, industrialization, mining, and customs cooperation. He works with ESA technical professional management, leadership, and political levels. As I earlier mentioned, we shall be able to listen to two other distinguished speakers with immense careers in international trade and multilateral trade issues, namely, is the Excellence Ambassador. Wakele Mene, the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, and Ambassador Alan Hoff, the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. You do recall that Ambassador Mene was elected by the State State Ordinary Session of the Assembly of Heads of State and Governments of the African Union to the position of Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. Prior to being elected Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area, he served as Chief Director, Africa Economy Relations at the Department of Trade and Industry of South Africa. In this law, you are called Chief Trade Negotiator in the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and Strapatite FTA negotiations. During his tenure as Chief Negotiator, South Africa ratified both the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and the Tripartite FTA agreements, providing new export markets in fast growing and dynamic markets in East and West Africa. Prior to assuming this position, Ambassador Mene was Director of International Trade Law and Investment Law at the Department of Trade and Industry, a law in which he was Principal Legal Counsel on International Trade Law and International Investment Law. From 2010 to 2015, Ambassador Mene represented South Africa at the World Trade Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. During his posting at the WTO, Ambassador Mene was elected by over 130 governments to the position of chairperson of the Committee on International Trade 
in financial services, a committee comprising trade negotiators, financial regulators, financial policy makers from over 160 countries. I also wish to welcome Ambassador Alan Hope, who is the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. He became Deputy Director General in October 2017. He was formerly in private law practice in Washington, D.C., dealing extensively with international trade matters. Prior to joining the WTO, he was Chairman of the National Foreign Trade Council, the oldest American association supporting all. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lepimile's connection seems to have frozen. We'll give him one minute to continue, and then we will hand over to His Excellency Wam Kelemene. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to, to now invite His Excellency Wamkele Mene to address us, to make a keynote address for the opening of the 2020 annual conference. It's a great pleasure, Ambassador and His Excellency, to join us this morning, and uh, we look forward to your address. Thank you so much for taking time from your very busy schedule to join us this morning. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Trudy, and thank you to Tralek for, uh, for inviting me uh, once again. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to participate at this conference. I think the last one that I participated in was um, in, uh, uh, in Kigali, um, just after the, um, the agreement was signed. Um, and here we are uh, having uh, 28 ratifications um, so we've made quite a lot of progress since the last time that um, I addressed or participated uh, in the trailer conference. We are now meeting, as was noted um, in the opening remarks uh, by the chairman, we are meeting in very, very difficult circumstances for global trade. We're meeting in very, very difficult circumstances for public health. Uh, global public health, um, and all of this has had a, um, an impact, of course, on uh, this COVID-19 crisis has had an impact on um, the African continental free trade area and on our preparations uh, for commencing trading under the AFCFTA. And I will speak uh, a little bit um, about that. But before we we point to uh, the challenge, uh, the challenges that uh, COVID-19 has presented. I think it is worth to, to briefly take note of um, why this agreement is so critical uh, for Africa's economic development and for Africa's uh, regional integration. Africa's intra-Africa tra intra trade is at a very low uh, percent of 18%. We trade more with the outside world as Africa than we trade amongst ourselves. We trade over 54% of our trade is uh, with the European, with European countries. We rely exclusively on uh, two or three supply chains for our import and exports. 
And when there's a global disruption of this nature, um, we feel the results of having a very, very narrow um, export base. We have um, in Africa, we have a big challenge uh, with a shallow industrial base. We have a big challenge of a lack of productive uh, capacity. We have a big challenge of not being able to have economies of scale. Uh, we have a big challenge of um, a, a small economies. And so the heads of states in Johannesburg in 2015 decided that some of these challenges can be overcome by having a, an African continental free trade area and that we need to use this continental free trade area as a driver of integration in Africa, as a driver of industrial development um, in Africa, and of course, as a driver of establishing a, um, an investment climate that is suitable and that will facilitate uh, growth as we, as we, as we go uh, on year on year. So this agreement is very important from the perspective of developing Africa's industrial development and pushing forward Africa's ability to produce value-added products and to export uh, value-added products amongst ourselves. And then also, it's very important to enable us to have specialization in trade so that we don't export apples uh, for apples and that we have a sophisticated regional supply chain, a sophisticated supply chain of centers of manufacturing excellence across the African continent. This is what Article 3 of this agreement foresees, that the Secretariat will drive this process working with the, the DTI of the African Union Commission as the policy body, will drive this process of establishing uh, value chains in Africa. And already I have been in discussions with three of the world's top uh, automobile uh, uh, manufacturers with a view to having them uh, re-look at, at Africa as a very attractive investment market with a view to having them shift their production structures, particularly production of components uh, from other parts of the world to um, Africa creating jobs, millions and millions of jobs um, here in Africa. So there is a unique opportunity that this agreement presents to Africa for Africa's economic development. Recently, the World Bank released a study and one of the observations of that study is that where implemented, where implemented this agreement has the potential to lift 30 million Africans out of extreme poverty and 60 million Africans out of moderate poverty by the year 2035 if we implement this agreement uh, uh, properly. This is the impact that it will have. And most of the gains that we will have made from implementing the agreement will actually be accruing to women in trade which is going to be an area of focus, of particular focus for me. It is going to be an area of priority uh, for me. How we, do we make sure that uh, women in trade, whom we know are the, are the, um, the drivers of um, the informal sector, of informal trade, how do we make sure that we bring them on board as, um, as a, a, a beneficiary, a very important beneficiary, a very important segment um, of our society. Young Africans in trade. We know that there are Africans across this continent who are very, very innovative, who are uh, um, at the cutting edge of research and development for IP, for IT enabled digital platforms. We have to make sure that, um, that young Africans see this agreement and it must impact uh, on their lives in a positive way. If we, do not, if we do not include with us the most um, vulnerable segments of society, 
this agreement shall be rejected by Africans and deservedly so. If the agreement benefits only the big multinational corporations in Africa, it is not going to succeed. In fact, we know from the uh, experience of other parts of the world, we know what happens when a trade agreement uh, in its implementation and in its benefits, we know what happens. Um, we know that the, 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 the result is that you do not have inclusive growth and that citizens don't feel that they are part um, of the trade agreement. And so we are determined to absolutely change that. We are determined to avoid that mistake of, uh, of making this agreement appear as if it is there to benefit only the multinational corporations. Second, if the agreement is, is perceived to be benefiting the already industrialized countries, again, it is going to fail. It is not going to succeed. But yes, we must concede that the immediate beneficiaries uh, of this agreement will be countries that, are, that already have an industrial base, that have an industrial capacity. However, we've got to change that. We've got to make sure that there is inclusive growth and inclusive development. And I mentioned earlier, I mentioned uh, um, uh, regional value chains. I mentioned the, the some of the tools that we can deploy to make sure that in time, that even countries that today may not have an industrial base, may not have an industrial capacity, but in, in, um, in 10 years to 15 years time, these countries would also be able to, be, uh, to have an effective productive capacity and to create jobs on the basis of the African continental free trade area. And we know from the experience of some region, the East African community, SADC, we know that this can happen. And we know that there are countries that may seem to have small populations, small markets, but they benefit from being part of a regional value chain as time goes by. And this is exactly uh, the model that we want to follow of inclusive growth as we implement uh, this agreement. It was noted at the beginning that uh, COVID-19 has uh, slowed down um, and has uh, compelled us uh, to, to slow down the negotiations and has compelled us to recommend to the heads of states that uh, uh, the trading date should start from 1st of January 2021. Um, that gives us a little bit more time to conclude on the outstanding matters and to position ourselves to be ready for implementation. I am sure that uh, Commissioner Muchanga, when he appears um, before uh, this panel, uh, I'm sure he will go into details um, about that. So let me conclude by saying the following. The COVID-19 public health and also economic crisis has exposed Africa's weakness, that of over-reliance um, on value chains that take us uh, to other countries. It has exposed um, the, the weakness of over-reliance on the export of commodities, primary commodities. And this means that we have to make sure that the AFCFTA um, enables countries to fundamentally restructure their economies such that um, we have a more diversified export market and a more diversified economy, uh, of course. So industrial development, uh, COVID-19 has um, placed industrial development really at the center of uh, uh, what we need to do as Africa to recover from this crisis. If as we go forward, we fail to take this opportunity uh, to accelerate our industrial development action plans and implementation of our industrial development action plans in accordance with Article 3 of the agreement, we will have missed a, um, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so whilst COVID-19 is a crisis, is a public health crisis, is an economic crisis, 
that has the services sector alone in Africa is set to lose up to $35 billion uh, this year. Africa's economy is set to, uh, 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 to shrink, uh, to contract by up to 5% um, this year alone. So the challenges uh, uh, are deep. And we believe that we can overcome these challenges if we implement the agreement. If the agreement is part of an array of tools that we deploy to reinvigorate Africa's economy, I think we will be in a much, much better position in a year or two years time. We know other countries have the capacity, they have the fiscal uh, policy space, they have the, the, the monetary policy space to provide billions and billions and sometimes trillions of uh, US dollars uh, to re-inject growth um, in the economies and to provide a stimulus to the economy. Many African countries will not be able to afford that. That means that as Africa, we have to move very, very rapidly and, agree and, and implement this agreement in a very aggressive way so that intra-Africa trade becomes Africa's economic recovery post COVID-19. So that intra-Africa trade becomes the driver of economic recovery in Africa um, from 2021 year on year. This is our only opportunity. This is our only stimulus package as um, the African continent. It is implementation of this agreement. I think that the last uh, point I would make about COVID-19 is it has compelled us to relook and to make a, a new assessment of um, Africa's uh, intellectual property rights laws. We have to ask ourselves, to what extent does our current IP regime, how flexible is it? And of course, here I'm talking about patents. How flexible is it? Um, in the sense of advancing our um, public health objectives? Does it facilitate the establishment of a, a, a generic industry, a generic drug industry across African countries? Does it facilitate the uh, uh, rapid um, rollout of our industrial development action plans throughout the African continent? Does our IP regime uh, foresee that um, it will be a tool that we deploy in relation to industrial development. I think these are some of the key questions that now come up post COVID-19 that we have to grapple with and hopefully we have to find uh, solutions to. And so thank you very much for inviting me to uh, uh, speak at this conference. Uh, I wish uh, that uh, the next time we're able to meet in person, um, but uh, for now, it seems these are the, um, the platforms we have to rely on. So thank you very much once again for, uh, for inviting me, and I'm, I'm happy to take a few questions if there will be any. Thank you. While our chair connects with us again, Your Excellency Wamkele Meni, thank you so much for those opening remarks. You've covered a very broad range of issues and you have prompted a number of questions to come through. Thank you for generously offering to, to respond to three of those. That means I have to be a little bit selective in taking a look at the questions. Ladies and gentlemen, just to, to note that by the end of this week, we will put out a Trelloc newsletter, which will consolidate and report back on the conference. And we will also include all of the questions and hopefully answers from, from the panelists and our, our distinguished speakers. I see Ms. Salipa Emilia has joined us. George, thank you so much. Over to you for the vote of thanks while I select three questions. Uh, thank you, Trudy. I also join you to thank uh, his Excellency Ambassador uh, Mene for highlighting the key issues involving the, uh, the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area. 
and uh, it gives us a lot of uh, uh, hope that uh, things are on course and uh, they've given themselves a deadline of 1st January 2021, which is so near, but with a commitment by the member states, the secretariat at the African Union, I think you'll be able to do, to kick start uh, the working at the secretariat. As we agree with him that uh, the war agreement set up should show the benefits, not only to the member states, but uh, the citizens of uh, Africa, to see that the new continental trade order is uh, tailored in such a way that uh, even the small scale traders, the youth, the entrepreneurs in our respective member states, uh, they find the broader markets and they are able to link themselves with the, all the markets on the continent. So again, uh, we thank uh, Ambassador Mene uh, with uh, the work which is going on right now, more so for having found time to join us. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much, George, for those words of thanks, which we all echo. I would like to select three questions for you, Your Excellency Wamkele. I'm going to start with one by Patrick Lowe, who serves on the Trilac Advisory Board. And he's saying, does the Secretariat have any specific plans for developing infrastructure across the continent? Something that seems to be lacking in the context of building economic interdependence across the continent. And given the break in connectivity that we've just experienced firsthand, perhaps a little bit about digital infrastructure. Thank you so much. If you would care to respond to that one first, and then we'll take two more. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question uh, to um, uh, uh, Patrick. Um, hard infrastructure is, is not our mandate um, as, a, as a secretariat. Um, however, uh, we will work very closely with, with uh, Africa's multilateral development uh, institutions. We have already uh, engaged on a, um, a, a collaboration uh, with Africa Bank. I will soon be uh, approaching the African Development Bank and, and any other institution um, that would be willing to partner with us so that we can realize the objectives of the agreement. I think the underlying point of Patrick's question is absolutely correct. If there is no infrastructure, um, the, the market access that we are providing to one another um, will, not be, will not be useful. Uh, we need infrastructure. There has to be reliable roads. There have to be border postings that are efficient, that have um, the appropriate uh, equipment, uh, scanners, and so on. Uh, so we have to look at it from, from uh, the, the perspective of complementing the work on infrastructure development, the work that, um, uh, uh, that the African Development Bank is already doing um, on, um, in this area of infrastructure development, and also the African Union. Um, so although it may not be, it may not be our mandate, uh, infrastructure development, but it is critical to trade. Um, it is critical to uh, rolling out and implementation of the agreement. And so we will, we will work with, uh, with the African Development Bank and others to make sure that um, infrastructure and trade are, are two sides of, um, of the same coin. I think digital, um, what COVID-19 has demonstrated is, is that digital trade and digitization in general um, is now uh, a, um, the solution to, uh, um, it, it, it helps certainly during the course of the crisis. We know that um, in some countries, in some parts of the world, uh, people were, were, were accessing digital pharmacies, remote um, consultation of their physicians, all of these things are now happening. Um, I think for us, 
the question for the Secretariat is, what type of a legal framework do we establish? What type of a platform do we establish to, uh, to govern? Uh, digitization and digital trade um, in Africa. So the infrastructure from a digital trade point of view, infrastructure development is, is, is important. We know that if you go to Kenya or if you go to uh, uh, Rwanda, we know that um, women small trader farmers use digital platforms to access foreign markets. Um, those who export Kenya, uh, who export flour uh, from Kenya to Europe, they use digital platforms. And so we ignore digitization at our own peril. So we've got to develop a strategy, a very clear and compelling strategy for how we can um, ensure that our trade under this agreement is more efficient, more dynamic, and certainly more affordable. And these digital uh, uh, trade platforms enable all of that uh, to happen. And they are actually readily available. Everybody has a, um, a smartphone. That is what the, the farmers of cut flowers in Kenya, that is what they are using to access markets. So a, a digital uh, um, framework within the agreement um, is important. And we had spoken about it as e-commerce, but I think we need to look broader and say not just e-commerce, but digital trade. Um, how do we make sure that our customs authorities uh, move away from, from manually releasing a, um, uh, a, a certificate of origin? How can we make sure that we have a digital platform that all customs authorities on the African continent can switch on to, and that's using blockchain and, and, and other secure features uh, that these certificates of origin can be issued in a much, much faster turnaround time. So these are some of the things that, uh, that in general, we say fourth industrial revolution challenges. And it seems that it is now, uh, uh, it has been uh, the onset of COVID-19 has expedited um, some of the, the disruptors of uh, um, the fourth industrial revolution. And we have to we have to respond to that as Africa, and we have to be part of finding so the solutions. And what has been done already is instead of negotiating e-commerce or digital trade as phase three, it is now going to be negotiated as phase two because of the urgency of uh, the issues that relate to, um, to digital trade. So thank you very much for this uh, first set of questions. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. As you'll see from the questions, expectations for the AFCFTA and the Secretariat are running quite high. So no pressure, as they say colloquially. A second question comes from Daniel and Lela, and he says, Your Excellency Mene, what are African member countries in the various RICs doing to start national and regional value chains that will spearhead the AFCFTA? So far, there is very little in this area, yet massive opportunities exist. Thank you so much. I, I agree. I absolutely agree that there are massive opportunities in the development of regional value chains. I, I can't say for a fact um, uh, what is happening or what uh, each regional economic community is doing. Um, the agreement, the FCFTA, requires that we build on the progress that is being made by that has been made by the RECs, um, and that we we uh, collaborate uh, with the um, with the RECs because they are on the ground. They have been there for a very very long time. But what we our mandate is quite clear uh, in accordance with Article Three of the agreement. Our mandate is uh, uh, in terms of value chains is continental. Um, the, one of the potential investors that I was talking to, um, who said to me, how do we make sure that, um, that in countries that already do not have uh, productive capacity, that we are able to, uh, to set up a, a presence in that country, which will feed into the rest of the African continent? 
How do we make sure that we go to a country that today, as I was saying earlier, that today it would appear um, has no uh, uh, industrial base um, and we can, we can export uh, from there. And it is possible to do it. We know that in SADC, for example, Lesotho is connected with South Africa on the automobiles value chain. So it is possible to do it in a, in a, uh, um, a continental uh, level to establish some of these value chains. Some countries will focus on different components, uh, will focus on uh, uh, um, catalytic converters, Others will focus on, uh, on different components of a vehicle because we know a vehicle requires over 30,000 components. So my, uh, from having discussions with investors in the last four months, there is an interest uh, for the establishment of these value chains across the African continent, not just in countries that are already there. Uh, but of course, they are, they, are, they are waiting to see how our rules of origin regime uh, how it will be concluded. The, the, uh, the threshold for value addition that will be required is very important for them to know because that has an impact on, on their uh, um, investment pipelines uh, 10, 15 years uh, down the line. So I think rules of origin and um, industrial development are, are, are an integral part of um, how we should be looking at, um, at the development of Africa's uh, industry across the African continent so that we, we dismantle what I call the economic, uh, um, the colonial uh, economic model so that we're able to dismantle it completely uh, over time by focusing on our own industrial development um, as Africa. But we will need investors uh, for that. We will need African investors. And we will need also uh, uh, foreign investors to invest in very productive sectors of Africa's economy. But we have a lot of work to do because we have to establish and implement the right policy and legislative um, environment uh, for that to happen. And this is what this agreement is. Uh, it is a law that establishes a single, a single set of rules for uh, trade and investment um, in Africa. So I agree with Mr. Angela that we've got to focus on uh, industrial development in Africa. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for that comprehensive response. The questions keep coming, and um, I know your time is running out, so I'm going to go to, to a very brief one that comes from Professor Olua Lava. And he's asking what steps are being taken to encourage countries that are reluctant to ratify the agreement to do so as soon as possible. And if you could share with us some of the concerns that they may be expressing in terms of their hesitance to, to take that important step to undertake commitments under the AFCFTA. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again for the question. Um, as, 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 as you know, um, ratification is, um, is a very, very uh, uh, protracted and slow uh, process uh, determined by, in many countries, by um, the country's constitution. And so countries have to uh, um, adhere to their legal requirements as they implement the agreement. Um, I do know that there are, there are countries that have signaled that by the end of the year, they want to have um, deposited their instruments of ratification. Um, we have two more, I'm, I'm not able to announce yet until they deposit, but there are two countries that have committed that by the end of the year, they will ratify the agreement. Um, so I think we have to recognize uh, uh, that countries will move slower than others, um, but it is a sovereign uh, a decision and a, a sovereign process that said, this is the fastest instrument to be ratified under the African Union. Um, it has never be happened before, apart, of course, from the, the, the Constitutive Act of the African Union. Apart from that, this is the fastest ratification for 28 countries. And so I think we, we, we see in that 
a legal commitment um, that for countries to make sure that uh, they implement the, obligation of the uh, obligations of this agreement. 55 countries uh, um, out of 55, 40, uh, 54, 54 countries signed the agreement, which again demonstrates a political will and political commitment. The countries that uh, are, have not yet ratified, the, the reasons range. Some uh, attribute uh, this to their own, uh, the slowness of the domestic process. Others have expressed concern about, the, about rules of origin, about transshipment, whether or not this will open the door for third country goods to, be, um, uh, to come into the market which as we all know uh, will, will cause a displacement of uh, local employment. Uh, and we do not want this agreement to lead to job losses. We want this agreement to create jobs. And so to the extent that transshipment is a big problem, and all countries, by the way, share this concern about transshipment, uh, we have got to make sure that we work very, very closely with customs authorities across the African continent. We will, by the end of the year, we will arrange uh, to meet with customs authorities uh, to, to, to start uh, um, uh, preparations for trading. Um, if we are not able to implement the rules of origin regime of the AFCFTA, we will have these problems of fraudulent invoicing, we will have these problems um, of, uh, of, of transshipment. And so we have to provide an assurance to our customs authorities that um, we will put uh, measures in place as foreseen in the agreement. We will put measures in place to make sure that the capacity of customs authorities is improved and that they are well trained for the new challenges of implementing the AFCFTA tariff book. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take time and it is going to take uh, uh, quite a lot of resources um, to make sure that we, we bring on up to speed our customs authorities across the African continent. Because as we all know, um, uh, there are countries who are at different levels of um, efficiency in border management. And this is where this issue of, of leakage is always, uh, it always comes up. And so the countries that have expressed concern to me, this has been the issue. The second issue that they have expressed concern about is on trade remedies, that there's no capacity to implement the trade remedies uh, uh, regime, the annex, and therefore they are worried about um, their ability to uh, uh, invoke the tools that um, uh, the agreement uh, uh, foresees uh, anti-dumping and so on, that if they don't have the capacity domestically, how will they then be able to invoke the, um, uh, um, the annex on trade remedies where they think there is a need for them to do so? And so in this regard, we have to, we have to work uh, uh, with national governments. Uh, we have to work with TRALAC and get support uh, um, uh, from, uh, from TRADAC to develop a, a strategy for implementation of uh, building the capacity for implementation of the Trade Remedies Annex. And here I think we will have to be creative. It may not actually be required that every country has a, um, uh, that every country has a Trade Remedies Authority. Uh, at the moment, only two countries have Trade Remedies Authorities uh, in Africa and about 12 have legislation on trade remedies. So this points to the problem. But maybe we can approach this as a, 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 from an African institution perspective. We may want to think about the trade remedies authority for Africa, so that countries don't have to put resources to implement a, 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 the trade remedies, uh, uh, to institute a, a, a trade remedies authority. We may want to think about how uh, we, can, we can do that and focus our resources and focus our collective attention to an African uh, institution, uh, trade remedies uh, authority, building at the same time the capacity 
at, um, at, at national level, at policy uh, level. These are some of the things that I think, given the resource constraints and the massive task at hand, we should think about how we can more efficiently uh, establish trade remedies capacity uh, in Africa. So this is the other concern that, um, that has been expressed to me about uh, the inability of countries to, uh, to rapidly ratify uh, at this time. So thank you very much uh, again, Trudy, for the opportunity. I'm afraid I'm going to run and I hope you had saved the, the difficult questions so that I can run away. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the, um, the opportunity. Um, Kelly, thank you so much. This has been excellent. We will relay the other questions to you, to your <laughs> office for your consideration. I would very much like to emphasize what you have responded to in terms of customs and border management issues and improving our capacity. This, of course, is part of the fabric of improving overall trade governance across the continent. Extremely important. As far as trade remedies are concerned, what we have seen is two least developed countries recently leverage those particular opportunities to protect their domestic industry under WTO rules. It can be done even by least developed countries. Zambia and Madagascar have provided evidence of that. Thank you so much for taking time this morning to spend with us. It has enriched our discussion and provided an enormous platform for us to continue with this conference. Thank you so much and all the best with the work thank you are you doing to make I this reality. Thank you. I wish you successful deliberations and a success to your conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Over to Mr. George Lipemile.